Please let's pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Today we hear a story of amazing love and impulsive excess. The journey to Jerusalem that our Lord prophesied has become a hard reality as Holy Week approach. The Gospel of John tells us that Jesus is at the home of Mary, Martha and Lazarus on Bethany, a place that was an island of serenity for him during a troubling time. Interestingly, interestingly the Hebrew meaning of Bethany is the house of thieves, which is not only a beautiful name, but the implications that name has. Storm clouds are gathering around Jesus. You know the Pharisees and many others were nipping at Jesus' ankles and blowing his destruction. Remember that several religious and political groups already those time wanted to kill Jesus. They were in charge of harassing him, of lying about him, but they could not kill him without due charges for the use of blasphemy against God and for the politicians, the church of a revolutionary, a seditious. Our Lord's determination to speak with Samaritan women, heal on the Sabbath, eat with the unclean, criticize the government leaders, and be rebellious to accept the distorted interpretations of the religious leaders, has essentially drafted his death sentence. His decision to return to within five miles of Jerusalem to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead, it has been a great insult to the enemies of Jesus. A man who can res res resurrect the dead and who does not submit to the lay leaders, clergy persons and rulers must be eliminated as soon as possible. But for a little while, all the malice and threats are pushed back as Jesus settles into the quiet oasis of his friend's home in Bethany. His friends had scheduled this meal for Jesus. Indeed, shooting conversation creates a sense of well-being. Wonderful smells emanate from Martha's kitchen. And Jesus experiences a rare moment of joy and serenity. <coughs> Sorry. Lazarus, Martha, and Mary were siblings. We don't have many details, but we know that they were good friends of Jesus. So sorry, I needed to take to drink some water. <coughs> Martha served dinner to Jesus and his disciples. Lazarus was among those who joined Jesus at the table. You may remember this Lazarus had died days before. Jesus had delayed his arrival when his friend was seriously ill. That's why when he arrived, Martha, who is now serving dinner, had reproached Jesus for apparently not heeding his call. You know the story. Jesus ordered that the tomb be opened, and he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. And now Lazarus, 
days after is there sitting next to Jesus, enjoying Jesus' visit and eating the dinner that his sister Martha is serving them. There are a lot of popular sayings, and in this specific case, we can apply the next. No good deed goes unpunished. That is an ironic commentary that says that those who help others are doomed to suffer because of their helplessness. In bringing Lazarus from the dead, Jesus soon would pay the price. The Gospel of John is crystal clear. After Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the foreign seas and told them what he had done. So the chief priest of the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, What are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You do not understand that it's better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest, that year he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. So from that day on they planned to put him to death. While Jesus is God, he's also a human being. Jesus was exhausted to be continually singled out and harassed by those who were against him. Please remember that Jesus was not enjoying those moments. We have already talked about it. In this context, Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, appeared dramatically. She had been in her room. But she suddenly returned with a jar filled with a very costly perfume made of pure nard. The woman knelt and broke open the jar, filling the room with a wonderful aroma. All eyes were focused on Mary as she loosened her hair, something a single woman would never do in public. She then proceeded to pour the perfume not on Jesus' head, but his feet. In the process, she tortured him, another violation of the prevailing sense of social decorum in the Jewish society of that day. And then, to bring this off demonstration to a conclusion, Mary waited her Lord's feet with her hair. In Judaism, hair was associated with a woman's glory, self-worth and respect. So not only did Mary pour an extremely expensive ointment on Jesus' feet, but she also used her hair to wave the oil that did not get absorbed into Jesus' skin. In other words, she placed her self word at his feet. She gave him her riches and her glory. Most of the time, when we do things for the ones we love, we use our best. 
We make our tasty dishes for people when they come. We make sure to do our best when fixing things for loved ones. Mary used the absolute best materials that she had for spreading the ointment, ointment on Jesus' feet. She wanted to use her hair so that the softest and most gentile material would touch his skin. It was St. John red and rag that was pulled out of the cabinet. No! It was her personal covering that God had given her and she chose to use it for the glory of God or God. Nothing else could have been good enough for her to spread the ointment on Jesus' feet. From my own experience and Hispanic culture, I firmly believe that love has to be demonstrated in concrete actions in any of its facets. From my point of view, true love will always include some kind of extravagance. When I lived alone in Sheboygan six years ago and finally had my first vacation, I drove my car a thousand miles from Sheboygan to Sanford, North Carolina, to visit my wife Erica. I spent 19 hours driving. I only stopped to get gas. I did not stop to rest. There is no need for you to tell me something. It was a mistake. I should have stopped and rested on the way, but my love made me do that. Mary really loved Jesus with all her being, and she showed it without a doubt. There is a similar story in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But only John places this event in the home of Jesus' special friends in Bethany. Women were significant in the ministry of Jesus. They were the ones who had the privilege of knowing first of the resurrection of the Lord. But the saying says that at every party, there is a party pooper. The Gospel of John records the objection from Judas Iscariot. Why? Was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common poor and used to steal what was put into it. Mary's perfume was costly, equivalent to a work salary for a year or are the current members for the Bureau of Labor Statistics of the United States that was a perfume of $52,000. Apparently Judas was outraged you thinking for the common good of the poor stick to the budget. Still, like many who say that they do things for the good of others or because it's everyone's claim, the Bible itself, itself says that Judas was thinking on his personal interests, as is often the case. How common is for people to see apparent excesses in the behavior of others while they will find nothing inappropriate in their priorities and self-indulgence. Just last week, we studied the parable of the dysfunctional family as the father showed an extravagant, abundant love for his, for his son, who has returned after dissipating his life and resources. God is like that. His love is exuberant, overflowing. Mary of Bethany 
of the house of the figs. The friend of Jesus has spilled all three quarters of a pound of that pure nard perfume. She has spent something that cost a lot of money on Jesus. I did not start to do calculations. She used all the perfume, not a little, not what was necessary, but everything in abundance. All the equivalent, $52,000. And not only that, but she did not care about the opinions of others. And not only that, yes, she did not care about the opinions of others. The parable's father ran to meet his son and kiss and huge him. He gave him a great party and restored him to his status as a son. He did not care about being offended. Mary unties her hair in the presence of Jesus. Can you imagine the gossip? I am listening to them from here. That was inappropriate behavior for a woman. And I directly, it was also probably inappropriate behavior of the Master Jesus. For not having stopped Mary. Can you listen to the gossip? Scandal! And she, with her hair, whipped his feet dry, ignoring it. Amid the harassment that Jesus experienced by those who wanted to kill him, that visit was a true oasis. Jesus then defends Mary against the criticism to her. Leave her alone. This perfume was to be used in preparation for my burial, and this is how she has used it. It was true. It was a prophecy. On Good Friday, the events were so fast that when they took the dead body of Jesus from the cross, it was already late, and they could not prepare his body for burial according to Jewish tradition. So Mary had done it ahead of time. All pastors would like to have many Lazarus, Marcus, and Mary's. Sadly, they are not common. And they are very rare jewels. I thank God for all the Marys who can be women or men for their extravagant generosity and above all, love, support, and prayer. By the way, some found out this week that in these months, many pastors have decided to resign from the pastoral ministry due to already busy work, as so many do not believe it, added the complexities of how to care for the congregation of COVID-19. Today, more than ever, they are necessary, the Lazarus, Marcus, and Marys in the churches. In that context, I want to make public my gratitude to Morphe's family, because at the time I needed it most, for reasons you already know, this Dale's family, without my asking, have lent me one of their cars for several weeks, sorry, so that I can continue doing my ministry. Thank you very much for their abundant generosity. Thanks also to Dave Clark and family and Grandma Afi. Thanks to Forrest and Linda Dowling. All of you are like Mary. And there are another Lazarus, Martha's, and Mary's among us. Just a week ago, Earl Nelson received the award of being the firefighter of the year. Only a helpful, constant person with a big heart for the community could obtain such a award. Congratulations, Earl. Christian faith. With that love, passion, giving, and extravagance, it's a pretty tool. Pretty blue thing. 
Jesus gave himself generosity, entirely for the sake of the world. Today, by participating in the Holy Communion, we accept the generosity of Jesus once again. Let's be like Mary, or Martha, or Lazarus. Please, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, because you gave yourself without mission to us by giving your life on the cross. Lord, help us to be like Mary, who expressed her love to Jesus without calculations. By participating in this holy sacrament, we reaffirm this covenant with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.